like on on our ward the first time the crash call the crash bell got called you know i was shitting myself <laughs> I, was like, I was like what the hell do i do like <laughs> the first time you see a patient alone your anxiety is going to be here and the tenth time it's going to be here and the hundredth time it's going to be here and i was shocked it just like i left on friday and i was like wow i'm, I'm like genuinely sad right now you know mm. like these conversations do have an effect on you you know even talking about it now i, I can feel myself a little bit emotional mm -hmm. the transition from finally your medical student to doctor is that it literally goes like this i said something along the lines of do you want me to tell you how i really feel or do you want me to tell you something just to make you feel better you know i try to have a bit of fun engagement when i'm talking to someone on the phone um, just out of politeness nothing else really um, and yeah, it just, it rubs me the wrong way when people are so just like rude or miserable or short. Uh, you know, we're all working towards the same goal. I'm not calling you for fun to waste your time. <laughs> I'm calling you because I'm concerned and I have a question and yeah. you're a specialist in this field, right? Welcome to the Medconceptions podcast. The following is a conversation with Nazir Karma. Nazir is a foundation year doctor in London. He's also known for his YouTube channel, Karma Medic. In this channel, he has over 1 million subscribers and he talks about productivity, education, and lifestyle. In this podcast, he shares his experience from a medical student to becoming a doctor, the ups and downs of it. We also touch upon mental health, multitasking, and workplace bullying. Overall, I think it's a very genuine conversation. And if you take in mind the fact that this is probably the first proper conversation I've had with Nazir, I think it it comes to show what a um, approachable and humble character he has. I, I really enjoyed filming this episode and I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So, how you been? You okay? Yes, I'm good. I'm very, very good. Excited yeah? to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's a true pleasure. And to be honest, I'm very humbled by the fact that you actually like accepted to come. I Thank did. you. I did. And the story of, of how you, you invited me on the podcast, that's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, the, the fact that I didn't know that you spoke Greek and then, yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah. You came and found me in the cafeteria. And you're like, hey, come on the podcast. It's like, yeah, sure, send me an email. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Simon was like, I think he's like, oh, you should go, you should go. She kind of nudged uh, me. This was your but, idea. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, you need that nudge in the beginning. You do, it's true. But yeah, so how does it feel... Start with the first question. How does it feel being called doctor? Oof. Um, even today, to be honest, I was writing in the documentation, elderly care ward round, Dr. Karma. And every time I write it, it feels a bit strange. Because, um, you know, you're, you're so used to calling other people doctor and referring to your consultant or your registrar or whatever as doctor. But when you write Dr. Karma and it's like, oh, yeah, that's actually me. My name is going to be there as the responsible doctor. It's, it's interesting. It feels really good. Uh, I'm still getting used to it. Yeah. Do you feel like, I don't know, uh, do you feel like you, show sure, like you feel like you earned it, but like when, when people, yeah, I don't know, like with me being six year medical, uh, I'm fourth year medical student now, so being a six year medical student, then in, in the blink of an eye, it just mm. turns like you're a doctor. I just yeah. feel like there's so much responsibility under that doctor title. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is the word that I was going to use when you said, you know, you must feel like you've earned it. Yeah. What I was going to say is that you feel like you've earned the responsibility to be a doctor, right? But you still have that responsibility. It's not like you get there and you've earned it and now your job is done, just go be a doctor. Yeah. You've earned the responsibility of being a doctor, which comes with a lot of, in my opinion, like weight and um, emotional feeling and seriousness. It carries a lot of weight with it, and, yeah. you know. Um, and that transition does happen very, very fast. You'll be a final year <laughs> medical student in no time. You'll be doing your SJT and your final exams and whatever. And then l literally you get a couple weeks off or two months or whatever. And you show up on day one and it's like, hey, you're a doctor now. Go do X, Y, and Z. Uh, so yeah, happens pretty fast. Do you feel like you are a doctor? <clears throat> like the things that you do every day? Are they like, yeah. Because I've heard like from a lot of people like, oh, you're a glorified secretary. That's yeah. what FY ones are, yeah, and yeah. It, it always a bit kind of it kind of disappoints me because I'm like I don't want to be a glorified secretary. I want to have how's that? Yeah, um, I I definitely get what you mean. I think you know my my friends uh, ask me this question all the time, and my response has been as of late. Now I really feel like I am a doctor. I'm like making decisions. I'm seeing patients on my own. I'm thinking about uh, you know what underlying diagnoses they might have, drug treatments that I can give. 
implementing those treatments, seeing how they make an effect, what kind of effect they have, mm -hmm. monitoring that through bloods, through um, their clinical condition. And I feel like I'm a doctor. And one of the things that makes me the most feel like I'm a doctor is the, the sort of difficult and heavy conversations that you have with next of kin. So with family members, with mm. the children of the patient, with uh, friends, family, those heavy conversations when, you know, there's really serious things happening with the patient, those make me feel the most like a doctor because I feel like I'm in a position of real responsibility and real importance in conveying certain information to patients and their family. Mm. Um, and that, that's, for me, what's been, what's felt the most like I am a doctor now. I know you've been on a geriatric ward, right? And that yes. you just finished today. So Yeah, I just finished today. Congratulations about that. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thanks. First rotation uh, done. First rotation successful. Uh, <coughs> seeing you do that constantly, like look on yeah. the, I like that. Nice. And I knock wood a lot. <laughs> it's um it's a way of externalizing like the luck that's involved in something, you know. Yeah. I'm just like oh touch wood, someone's watching over me, someone's helping. The luck is on my side somehow. I don't know. <laughs> that's the general idea behind it. I like it. Um <coughs> So when you said heavy conversation, I was thinking geriatric ward, put the things together, um, palliative. So I was thinking, mm -hmm. so your your father, <coughs> your grandfather, your wife is mm. going to die. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Oh, like in terms of the types of conversations yeah. that we have? So it's not quite that that short and blunt. <laughs> no, of um, course, but like yeah. the context. <laughs> but the main idea when you're palliating someone, which means that you are stopping the active treatment that you're giving the patient, the patient um, and you're moving towards a approach of keeping them comfortable, pain-free, symptom-free, and just trying to have whatever remaining life they have be as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. So you're stopping things like IV antibiotics, blood tests, you know, giving them oxygen, etc. a lot of the time, and you're focusing on no pain, no agitation, no symptoms. Um, and so the conversation that you tend to have with next of kin is helping them understand that, you know, medicine can only do so much. And at this point in time, we think that um, we may be causing more harm than good by continuing to have active medical management. And we think that it would be in the patient's best interest if we move towards a palliative care approach. Mm. That's kind of where the majority of the conversation is. And because a lot of people don't understand that. Mm. They think, you know, you're in the hospital, you have all these drugs, you have all these doctors, like they just, should be a just solution. fix my family. Yeah. yeah. There, there must be a way, just keep them alive, even if it's for one more day. Um, ugh, I'm getting a bit emotional talking about it. Um, yeah, a lot of people just want to keep them alive for one more day, for one more week. Just keep trying, keep trying. But a lot of the time, that's not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that's what the conversation is about most. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure it's tough. And it's tough because yeah. you, <laughs> you're a foundation, you're a doctor, and you're expected to do this. So mm. I guess it's, it's that thing that you're thrown into the middle of the ocean and you kind of have yeah. to... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the, the kind of rotation you're on. You know, I'm sure a lot of F1s in surgical specialties probably have to deal with acutely very unwell patients and trying to manage them maybe on their own when there isn't as much senior support. Mm -hmm. And then on a ward like Jerry's, the, the difficult thing for the F1 to do may be um, these types of conversations with patients and their family. It depends. It's a very varied experience. If you want, do you have any stories that kind of like have... Any patient encounters? I'm sure you've had oh, many. Too many. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Um, like, I won't talk about anything specific, but a lot of these conversations, you know, I, I still remember the patient's names. Like, I remember the, the family members' names. I remember what the conversation was like, you know, who was, uh, and how, how different people handled it. You know, people dealing with grief and with coming to terms that their family member may pass away or will pass away. People deal with it in very different ways, you know. Uh, some people are much more understanding and sort of informed about this whole palliative care thing. Other people are very much in denial. And, you know, people's emotions run really mm. wild, uh, really high. So there's been a lot, a lot of interesting conversations, a lot of very meaningful ones. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that I remember really well. <laughs> but, uh, you yeah, know, we won't go into detail about that. How does that affect you, though? Because I guess mm. it's a job. Like, you, you do your eight to five, mm. and then you have to ba go back home and go see your girlfriend, go see your sister, and yeah. yeah. Um, 
I remember a couple of weeks ago, I left work on Friday and I was in the car and I called my girlfriend and I just said to her, like, I feel, I feel so sad. And um, the reason I felt sad was because over the last two days, Thursday, Friday, I'd had five conversations with five different families about uh, end of life and palliative care mm. and stopping, uh, you know, active treatment. And it just like, I left on Friday and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm like genuinely sad right now, you know? Mm. Like these conversations do have an effect on you. You know, even talking about it now, I, I can feel myself a little bit emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, you mostly, you just deal with it, you know, you, you do what you need to do, you document in the notes, you go home and everything's okay. But somewhere deep down, <laughs> it, is, it is all there. I think it'll take some time to kind of learn how to manage those emotions properly over the long term. Um, but uh, yeah, some stuff does come home with you for sure. Do you think, I don't know, I'm thinking exercise. Like for me, I think exercise is one thing that kind of cardiovascular exercise. So like cardio, okay. so going for a run and clearing your mind and mm. stuff like that, that helps me. Like I definitely haven't had the same intense experience <clears throat> as you have, but um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, exercise is, is obviously great, and I feel like it was such a core coping mechanism for me in medical school with being stressed and overwhelmed and having too much to do on my to-do list and whatever. Um, I feel like now, since I've started working, I don't have that much, that similar feeling of being extremely overwhelmed. My to-do list is very long. I've taken quite a significant step back from the YouTube channel and mm. almost all my time is focused on medicine related things. Um, and so I've, I've, I've also like started playing a lot of video games by myself, seeing my friends a lot more, going out. And so the gym has kind of been replaced for me with those activities. Mm. I don't have the need to go run my heart out and forget about what's on my head. Um, but I miss the gym a lot. And I do want to go back, um, <laughs> but it's not as... Uh, it's not like a necessary component of my day anymore. Um, mm. So it, it's harder to find time for it, I think, for sure. So I think this is a good point for me to ask the one mm. of the questions that I really wanted to ask you. Okay. Because this is what I'm going through mm. and um, trying to balance everything. Yes. So um, just for some context, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure very few of the subscribers uh, don't know this, but you, you have a YouTube channel, a very successful YouTube channel. Uh, it's one million and going up sub subscribers. That's amazing. That needs hard work, dedication. So, mm. yeah. And then you also have got a long-term relationship, which I know from my experience as well, that it's something that needs care. And it's like you, you kindle it yeah, and you grow sure. and, it, and it needs care constantly. Yeah. You can't just leave and then be like, oh, I've, I have a relationship and that's it. Yeah. You can't <laughs> take a break. <laughs> you can't take a break. Yeah. And then adding to that, you're a medical student. So you went through medical school doing, doing this. I don't know. When did you start the YouTube channel? Uh, I started medical school in 2017. Um, so early 2018. Yeah. Somewhere there, maybe March. And then, and then you, like I've heard okay. you talk about your exercise, which like, <laughs> uh, now you don't do it as often, but mm. still. And then you got your social life. You want to see your friends. And so practical advice to, to me and anybody else struggling. <laughs> <laughs> or um, how you feel about it. It doesn't have to be practical advice. Yeah. I think how I felt at the time when I was doing all of that and how I feel now looking back on it are very, very different. I um, okay. I feel now looking back on it, I genuinely have no idea how I managed to do all those things that I was doing in a single day and keeping on track of you know all those different aspects of my life. Um, I was just in such a, like a horse with the blinders on, you know, really fo tunnel vision focused on several goals and just making sure that they were done every day. But um, I, I genuinely don't, like thinking about it now, I don't know how I was able to do that on a daily <laughs> basis for so long. I, I really don't know. Because now the idea of like using up every spare minute of my time to be productive and go to the gym, then see my friends, then work out, then edit a YouTube video, then whatever, like, it sounds crazy to me, you know? I'm like, yeah. I just want to relax. Like, I want to have a bit more fun. I want to call up my friend, call up my girlfriend, <laughs> just chat, you know, uh, be more present in the moment. Mm. I think a lot of the time uh, when I was running around in medical school, I was very much not present on, in the moment, but focusing on what was the next step, what was the next thing I was going to do and how I was going to achieve it. 
And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't get stressed. I didn't get tired. I just like worked <laughs> and slept very little. Um, and it worked out. I don't know. As far as practical advice goes, I think you can break down what I did into smaller steps and it's feasible and doable for a lot of people. I've talked about that extensively in my videos and I think if you listen to those videos, it's not, there's no magic bullet, there's no secret sauce. Mm. You know, it's, it's quite literally just like be very, very organized, manage your time extremely well, be disciplined, blah, blah, blah. There's no magic bullet to, to what I did. But, um, but yeah, it takes a lot of effort over, over time. I think over time is the difficult part. Mm. Doing any of these things for a short period of time is is not that difficult, but doing it for years at a time is where I think a lot of people might struggle. You were talking about this on Ali Abdal's podcast, and mm. I remember you said, "I know exactly how much time it takes for me to do a coffee, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I know exactly how much time it takes for me to do tea." So I, I was like, like <laughs> I just yeah. I just had a moment of realization, and we like. Wow, like, yeah. <laughs> like you were on it. I was, and, I was. And the other thing that you said, which I, which I want to start doing, which I love, is you say, uh, like as a practical piece of advice, before you went to bed, I don't know if you still do it, I wanted to ask you about this, mm. you would sit down and, and write what you have to do the next day. Yeah. So the night before, you just sit down, write down like what <clears throat> the plan's going to be for the next day. Something that mm. I don't do and I have to start doing because I think that's going to help a lot. Because you wake up and you're like, oh, now I do a program. It's like... <laughs> Now yeah. it goes by. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do still do that. And I think like one of my just overall big philosophies is just to make as few big decisions in the day as possible. Mm -hmm. I think decision fatigue is a very real thing. Like, should I eat this or should I eat that? Should I drink this? Should I drink that? What clothes should I wear? Should I take the bus? <laughs> should I take the car? Should I? Now you wear scrubs. And I wear scrubs, <laughs> yeah. But I, I find that Anywhere I can eliminate decision making in my life, it, it makes my life so much easier. So yeah. making a small schedule before you go to sleep means that when you wake up, you don't have to think about what you're going to do today. Your little piece of paper is going to tell you what to do. And when you have something to do that you don't want to do, well, I've said to do a lot of times, um, but when you're doing something that you're not necessarily exciting about, like maybe you have to write an essay or a study, mm -hmm. having something tell you what to do is so much easier than sitting there and starting from a blank page. Um, and I think it makes a very, very big difference. I'm gonna, I'm gonna implement it and get back to you. Yeah, you should <laughs> make a video about it. Make a video about it. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know. I was thinking about making videos, which are quite different to podcast. Yeah, I don't know if we'll maybe sometime. You should. Yeah, it, like it's an absolutely different uh, skill. It's a different editing process. A different thinking and creative process. Uh, but they're both very fun. I love way. teaching, so that's one thing that I love doing. Me so. Too. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I might like it. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should try it. You've got nothing uh, to lose. That's true. How's the teaching with the medical students going on? Oh, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> Talk to me I, about it. <laughs> I love my medical students. Oh my god, I love them so much. The UCL medical students, right? Yeah, I mean they're they're mostly UCL here. Um, Is UCL better? Like, yeah. <laughs> be honest. No, no comment. No, no comment. comment. Okay. Um, but yeah, the the medical students are great. I mean. Anytime someone is even a little bit keen to learn or to see things or to do things, it makes my life so much easier. Mm. And um, I love seeing that from people. It makes me excited about wanting to teach them. I love teaching people. Um, and I love having medical students because I feel like I can give them the experience that I wanted when I was a medical student. Um, you know, instead of them asking, hey, can I do this? Hey, can I do that? Or sitting in the corner, not being acknowledged by anyone. I can, in, I can introduce myself, I can introduce them to the team, I can say, hey, you're going to follow me for today, you know, go take a history from this patient, go listen to this patient's heart, don't forget to listen to his chest, you know, mm. when I tell the medical student to do that, it's very easy, it's a no-brainer decision, they're going to go do it, right? But when you don't tell them, they, they just, a lot of the time, and I, I used to do this, you just stand there and you wait for something to happen, you wait for someone <laughs> to tell you to do something. I do, no, that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> and I, I get it, I get it. I was there and that used to be me and a lot of it is like this huge power dynamic you feel like you don't belong you feel like you're not part of the team like I completely get it and so I'm trying to you know eliminate that for at least the medical students that are with me um, and I hope if any of them are watching they they will say that I've, I've been a good uh, teacher <laughs> um, I'm sure you have um... What do you do when they come back and then they present your findings? Because mm. there's, a, there's different types of personalities I've seen with the clinicians. Sure. And then uh, what approach do you use? Are you just like, oh, tell me. And then do you correct them at the end? Or you're like, you're one of those guys like, oh, wait, okay. So go back. 
<laughs> um, I mostly just let the student say whatever they want, and I let them go on some super long ramble or tangent if that's where yeah. they go. Because when you go on that ramble or tangent, you know you're going on a ramble or a tangent, and you feel <laughs> like, oh my god, I'm going on a ramble or a tangent. And I think having that feeling and experiencing it makes you think next time, maybe I should keep it a bit shorter. Maybe I could change this. Maybe I could change that. Um, but all my feedback is usually at the end. Um, and it's almost always going to be lots of lots of good feedback with maybe just one or two things that could be better next time. You sandwich that in between the... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not even about that. The honest truth is that just the experience of presenting is the biggest learning point. Yeah. That's it. Whatever little comment I give at the end is like, you know, 10% of the journey of learning this presentation. Um, I'm still learning how to present properly, so I don't expect any medical student yeah. to, to give me a good one. Um, and yeah, it's more of just... Uh, having fun together. I always say at the beginning, you know, this is a non-stress zone. This is judgment-free. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. If you don't know, just tell me you don't know. If you have questions, just ask me. Um, and yeah, let's have fun together. Let's learn together. That's what yeah. I always say at the very beginning. Hi, my name is Nasser. Get their name and then that's my speech. <laughs> do, they, do they like freak out like, oh, see, I, I, I've seen you. <laughs> Um, there's, there's been a little bit of that for sure. Uh, most people just don't say anything until the last day and they're like, oh yeah, by the way, I watch your videos. Oh. Um, and then you have students who like keep coming back every day in the afternoon or every two days in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then they finish their elderly care placement and they still come <laughs> while they're on their next placement. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes we have to turn people away because, you know, we already have medical students. Yeah. Um, or we're too busy or whatever. Uh, but rarely. I hate turning away people. Uh, medical students because we're busy. I think we've done it once. Um, yeah. So, yeah. You're an agreeable personality, a very agreeable one. Like, agreeable one. Yeah, and like conflict averse. Would I um, say that? Can I say that? I don't know. If I get into conflict with people? Like, for example, what you said now. Yeah. Like, uh, I feel bad telling someone to, to go away. Mm. Like yeah, that kind sure. of situation. Um, I think my level of feeling bad won't stop me from telling someone to go away. Um, okay. If I need to. Um, but I still feel that emotion, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I think the overarching, quote unquote, correct thing to do is still what I will do. Um, mm. But I'll feel bad in the process if, if it's a situation like that. Uh, I'm like that as well. Yeah. I'm very conflict averse. Like when, when there's a conversation that's hard to be had, yeah, I kind of like delay it a bit. <laughs> and, I'm like, and at the end, I'm like, okay, now I have to do it and just yeah. commit to it. <laughs> like, I, would, I wouldn't quite say that I'm like that. I think I'm probably more confrontational than most okay. um, but my threshold for being confrontational might not be as low as someone else um, you know I brush a lot of things off my shoulder because I just don't care enough um, and like <laughs> you know like there's so many things I feel like can upset you on a day-to-day -day basis and so many like comments people friends colleagues yeah, can make that yeah. might like rub you the wrong way um, but like the threshold for me to care is really high. You know, <laughs> I have to really care. Um, and so most things I just brush off. But uh, if something needs to be said, then you'll say it. It used to be more like that when I was younger. Mm. Now as I grow up, I think I'm becoming more sensitive. I don't know why. Yeah, me too. It's, it's an interesting thing. <laughs> like I'm becoming more sensitive and I'm like, yeah. no, I just, I don't want to care so much. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm much more easily, a, like I cry a lot more in emotional movies and things like that. Where, same, when I was a kid, same, you never catch me shedding a tear, you know? Before I go and out. I'm like <laughs> trying to hold back my tears every movie I watch. And I'm like, this isn't even sad. You know? <laughs> what? I feel like crying. I think you realize, I think it's you realizing, I don't know. You kind of realize the reality of the world we're living in and like life. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. I'm just becoming soft with age. Uh, <laughs> with me, I my never. Sweet cred. <laughs> my like, I think when I was in high school, never mm. cried. Like I was a kid. Like, I was like, like whatever happened. Like oh, yeah. there was this. Yeah, even in even in very bad situations. Like I remember, like this situation. I was like, there's something wrong with me. Mm. Like why am I not crying? Yeah. And then after that. Yeah, years pass by now, exactly like you. I cry with movies and I'm like, and my sister, this is the funny thing, my sister looks at me and she's like, she, Why are you what? crying? Yeah. <laughs> and it's my sister who cries in every... I know the feeling. I Anyways. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I live with my sisters too, which is kind of cute. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Is she your twin um, by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, when I called, called my fiance yesterday, I thought I was going to have this conversation with you. Mm. And uh, I was like, I, I watched his video and we have so much in common. Mm. Like, 
he plays basketball. I play, I play basketball. Like, he snowboards. I snowboard too. It's like, I was getting excited. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, he has a broken front tooth here. And, and I was like, <laughs> I can't believe I, you know that. The, the, like, it's like, I have a broken front tooth too. Like, in the exact same tooth, I had it really? in an accident anyway. And I was like, I, go, I was like freaking out. Yeah. And then and the Marina was like, <laughs> uh, she was like, yeah, I guess the only difference is that in five years, he's going to have hair and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you got those Greek genes, yeah. You're definitely yeah. You're gonna start bolding real soon. My, my dad's bold as well, so I'm like, all my Greek <laughs> friends are bolding as well. Yeah, no, it's maybe. sad. You know, I'm too hairy. If one of the things I'm not gonna do is, you know, when people leave it and it, and you get the island you get thing, the side thing, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to do. You'll that. go straight to Turkey. You'll get a yeah. You'll come back. I found out people do this now here. Like they they go to Turkey and they do the hair. They also do other jobs. Like I think you can do your veneers, your teeth as well. Yeah, I didn't. I, I saw mean, like in, in the subway where you see it, like come yeah. to Istanbul For and example. do this and like yeah, yeah. oh it was like if you don't smile back mm. come to Istanbul and like do uh, your details. I was like why like why <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can do a lot of that. I've got I've got some more serious questions. <laughs> you can start <laughs> to get emotional again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Um, I've got a few here. Let's go for it. I will give up my life for my career. Or, like the other thing you hear, medicine is not a job, it's a lifestyle, it's a vocation. Mm. Taking in mind the long and many unsociable hours, going mm. beyond schedule, yeah. do you consider that to be true? Um, okay, repeat the question so I make sure I understood it. So, people say, when you go into, med- into medicine, I'm giving up my life, like for right. my career. Mm. And it's not like a nine to five job. It's like it's a it's a lifestyle. Like mm-hmm. your life is built around your job. It's mm-hmm. not there. Mm-hmm. It's it's not my life, and then my job is on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess many people now want to have their job doesn't don't want their job to be the central part of their life. So mm-hmm. what I'm asking is, is that true? Is does medicine take that central role in your life? Yeah, I think um, so. Obviously, I'm. I'm an F1 doctor. I've only been working for four months. Taking that in blah, mind. Blah, 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 blah. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Um, but, yeah, from what I've seen and what I understand, you know, a career in medicine is definitely a lot more involved in your life long term, um, you know, looking over the next 30, 40 years, um, as opposed to some other jobs or some other common jobs that you might have. Um, and... A lot of it is, um, you know, you need tons of hours to learn, to become more knowledgeable, uh, et cetera, to get to tick all the boxes for your certification of training, for making sure that your uh, knowledge is up to date with the exams you have to do every couple of years, with um, your registration and whatever. And also the unsociable hours. You know, I feel like if you work long hours, having said that, people in law, people in finance work probably even worse hours than, than a lot of doctors. Um, but uh, that in combination with unsociable hours, so working nights, working twilight shifts, working in the evenings, I feel like at least makes it feel like medicine is a much bigger part of your life uh, than another job might be. Um, as far as how I feel about that, I, th- I personally think that I would become really bored doing any one thing for the rest of my life. And I think if medicine was to be the entirety of my life for the rest of my life, I would become bored. Um, I, I enjoy the job so much, genuinely. Um, I was driving to work the other day thinking like about how excited I am to go and like see my colleagues and go talk to patients and like do all this fun stuff. I was genuinely thinking that in the car. Uh, so I love the job. Um, but I think if it was the only thing I did in my life, it would become boring. And so, you know, having that balance with hobbies, with, um, you know, socializing with your friends, with your sports, with maybe other passion projects that you have, whether that be something business related or not, if it's just drawing, if it's, uh, you know, walking with your friends in the park, like whatever it is, just having something else that you're passionate about, I think is really important. And I think Mm -hmm. anyone, I mean, there will be very, very committed people to medicine, which is completely fair enough, obviously. If that's what makes you happy, like good for you. Um, And that's an entirely reasonable point of view and, and viewpoint and I have nothing bad to say about it. Um, but for me personally, I think that I would need something else that I'm very passionate about in my life in order to keep the medicine being fun long term. You know, I've been working for four months. Talk to me in five years. Talk to me in 10 years. I might feel very different about what my day-to-day job looks like. Mm-hmm. I probably will. Um, 
And so I'm trying to <laughs> keep other things alive in, in my life uh, mm. as well as medicine. Um, yeah, that's my long winded mm, answer yeah. to your question. No, it, I feel like that too. Like when I think of myself in like 20, 30 years, mm. I want to be able to, you know, I want to have a family. I want to mm. have, have a life outside medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that, you know, I kind of ruminate about when I'm like thinking about what specialty to pick. Yeah. Yeah, same and, sure. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you, did you grow up in Greece? Grew up in Cyprus, so Cyprus. I'm not actually okay. from. Very similar, very similar. One pause. Do you mind if we close the aircon? Yeah, go for it. Are you cold? Yeah. yeah. Okay, fair enough. Are you? Are, are you? You gonna get hot? <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, my face will become a bit more red. But it doesn't matter. Do you want? Um, we can just put it a bit up. Okay. No, no, I don't mind. If you get hot, we just leave it. Leave it. It's fine. Sorry, yeah, um, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> you're freezing. Yeah. Um, uh, where were we, what were we talking about? Specialty. So I'm like ruminating about specialty because oh. I want to see like how my yeah. Now, I was asking you if you if you grew up in Greece. Oh, you yeah. said Cyprus, so, which works I, just as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, you'll know from having grown up in Cyprus that the culture there, like in Greece where I grew up and in the Arab world where I'm from, that a doctor is a god. You know, whatever the doctor says goes. Yeah. And doctors are, you know, people who you thank a hundred times before you leave their office. You mm. kiss the ground they walk on and you say, thank you so much for seeing me, for like taking the time, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like some people in the UK and in, you know, the more Western world have this belief that, you know, doctors, uh, it's a vocation. It's not a job. You know, it's something that they do because mm. that is their destiny and you know their entire job is to take care of other people their mental health isn't as important their physical health is not as important their job is for the patient their job is to take care of the patient um which i think is a really harmful position to put doctors in and mm. i think you know the general public and people in other professions need to understand and respect that doctors with the huge responsibility that they carry and with all the amazing things that they do they are just normal people like you and, us and me at the end of the day and, you know, they're not this superhuman who's immune to any mental health or physical health problems. <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, they deserve the same rest, the same ups and downs and difficulties that someone in any other career deserves. They're not a superhuman god, as a lot of people might look up to them, and as I did when I was younger. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think people need to cut doctors a little bit of slack. Um, mm. You can care immensely for your patients and you can do an incredible job and at the same time have your work be your work those two things can coexist it's not one or the other and i think that's really important for people to understand i think social media and like the whole internet thing is making this a bit it's kind of fading this away this idea that you described it's, mm. it's making doctors and seem more human like, I don't know if you, Dr. Glock, Glock and Fleck, Fleck, and probably watch yeah, him. I love him. <laughs> yeah, so he's like, he's an ophthalmologist. He, he does it, but then he just does comedy yeah. uh, on the side. Mm. And then there's other doctors, like on YouTube as well, like you, <laughs> uh, uh, which it's, you're normalizing it a bit and be like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a person with other interests as well. I do other stuff as well. Like I snowboard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, I think that's going to help in that kind of. Yeah, Aspect. I mean, I think that that stigma is largely breaking down, um, but you do you still do get a lot of people. I think, um, especially in the older generations, who kind of have that feeling of mm. you know your your job is to just treat me and make sure I'm better. Like, how dare you not spend a hundred hours with me and make sure that everything is okay and this and that. Like, look, yeah. it's okay. So, some some people come from older generations where that was normal and that's how they grew up and whatever. There's nothing I can do about that and. I don't necessarily blame them for feeling that way. Um, but I think, as you mentioned, a lot of that thinking is changing and it's not our responsibility, but part of what we do and the good that we put out there with the videos and the things that we do and make is, mm -hmm. is a bit of breaking down that stigma of, you know, uh, doctors can still be respectful, polite, uh, hardworking, uh, dedicated to their patients, but normal people at the same time. I hope these podcasts can help as well, because in a podcast, you kind of, you get to break down a bit someone's character, like how mm. they react, etc. Yeah. And then I used to also ask people, like, I've stopped doing it now. 
that okay. often, but like, what, what movie do you like and stuff like that? And it, yeah. you're just like, oh, my doctor watches movies. <coughs> mm. <laughs> hmm. isn't, that, isn't that strange though that you think, oh, my doctor watches movies? Like, what did you think they were doing? Are, are they sleeping in the hospital? Like, they're sleeping with the patient, you know, <laughs> making sure they're okay. You charge them at night and then they wake yeah, up the next day. <laughs> it's like, plug them into the wall and, <laughs> and charge them. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Really, that doesn't happen sometimes <laughs> because you you always need like you need the the, the person's touch, a person's like mm -hmm. it's, it's another thing. Like, yeah, that's why I think the role of a doctor or the role of a person in any job, not not, not only in the medical field, mm. yeah, the the compassion that a person can convey. There's some mm. studies on this, and like we've got some stuff coming up. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, how important it is like science based. Like, if you touch a patient. Mm that actually when you talk to them in a compassionate way of course mm. uh and that kind of affects that increases the chances of their treatment going well mm -hmm. like significantly yeah absolutely crazy I, I believe entirely yeah the placebo effect is very real <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely if you think you're receiving good care you your body will think you're receiving good care and you can get better than you would should you think you're receiving bad care with the same medication so yeah absolutely i think there's i think this overlaps with the kind of the positive the positivity kind of mindset mm. that there's someone out there that cares for me and mm. wants me to be good like knows me to get better i guess that helps in all things around in yeah, life for I sure guess. i mean just imagine you're sitting in a hospital bed and you're thinking um you know wow like everyone here is so nice to me like they're they're really treating me well like oh, i hope that medication that they're trying today is going to work um you know, like there's some sun in here, there's some good food, like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling hopeful, right? If you're a patient and you're feeling like that versus a patient feeling, oh God, like, why has no one come to see me yet? And no one's treating me well. I hate the nursing staff here. I hate this. I hate that. You know, your those two viewpoints, I think, would severely impact your um, recovery. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's been shown time and time again how powerful it is the thought of that you're getting treatment, the thought mm. that you're getting good treatment. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense. I think this is a place with catastrophizing, which is the process mm. of, um, just to give a little <laughs> context, is the process of, I have a bad thought, and then I kind of make that worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm gonna die because, I don't know, because I had a splinter in my finger, oh, I'm bleeding, all this, and there's <coughs> nobody cares, nobody loves me, you know, and it kind of, you start catastrophizing. And mm. I, I, I'm sure all of us have gone through the process of something small happens and then we start, everything's breaking down. <laughs> but yeah, that's true. Um, I wanna go to another question now. Got some stats here as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, Take a stats course. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> you, how, how old are you? You did. I'm 27 now. 27. See, the other foundation year doctors. How old are they? If they left straight from, if they went to medical school straight from high school, they'll be 23. Do you feel there's a gap between like? Yeah. yeah. Huge. Huge. I'm I'm a much different person now than I was four years ago. <laughs> of course, same thing. For sure. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you felt that in medical school as well. Mm, yeah. I like I already knew how to study. I was very confident in myself. I had a very good group of friends around me. Um, I had already taken like a hundred exams by the time I sat my first medical school. <laughs> like, exam. I'm a pro so, like, now. <laughs> you know, it didn't phase me. I was like, just gonna study, just gonna do the exam. I'll probably do well. See, if I don't, it's see, fine. <laughs> you know? that, that's a success factor though in the YouTube thing. Because mm. maybe you already had everything, like you already knew how to study, etc. And then you're yeah, like... 100%. I mean, th there are a million things that went perfectly right for my YouTube channel to, you know, gain the amount of viewership and success that it did. For yeah. sure. For sure, for sure. That was like crazy. an extremely lucky combination of um, many different things. I felt I felt that in first year as well. Like I heard of in first year I went. I did the military. So in Cyprus we have conscription. So okay. I like I did an extra year of school, I think because I went to, to like a, to do A levels. Okay. And so I did that as well. And then I did military. And then I came here and I was about two, three years older than the other people and I, I felt that difference. It's huge. And I, I hanged out with postgrads. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> like nice. an, another Cypriot, so I did military with them, which is pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, but now I feel like now that difference, I don't feel it anymore. Yeah. Um, As you grow older, that the feeling of that difference shrinks for sure. Yeah. When you're, when I was 22 and the my classmates were 18, that was a very big difference. You know, when I started Jeez. here in Kings, yeah. 
that's a very, very big difference. I mean, I'm sure you guys remember what it's like to be 18. Uh, how old are you guys now? Two. I'm okay, perfect. 24. <laughs> Think hard. <laughs> if it, um, it, probably, yeah. So yeah, I'll you get know, corrected. Obviously, obviously, a lot has changed um, in that time. Yeah. I'll go, let's go to the stats. <laughs> so, which one should we do? I got two. I got transition from. So it's six fifty-six. Yeah. Yeah. Just hit me. It's yeah. Um, we could do the transition from medical school to a, to foundation year or workplace bullying. Which one do you want to do? How is this a stats? question <laughs> <laughs> it will become a stats question hit me with the transition okay so how was the transition from medical to 241 mm. did you feel prepared for it thrown in the ocean that whole thing mm -hmm. and now i've got some so this this study published in 2022 um this is by moore et al i like seeing the names because we give credit to the people that, that did the study well. yeah, go ahead. um during the COVID pandemic um a new position was created for the in it was called the interim foundation year one program yeah i remember my friends did it. Amazing. So I don't even have to. So this was a final, final, final medical students. Four, four and a half thousand were enrolled in this. They were paired with a senior buddy. They, they had, basically, they had the same responsibilities as a foundation year. One doctor, they got paid the same. Mm. They were insured by the GMC. Um, and then they found that this, this whole, like, it was like, this, this whole, yeah, it kind of helped them uh, increase their self-perceived preparedness and yeah. also lower the anxiety yeah and these guys also found that that a lot of the foundation year doctors that didn't do this program that were going into foundation year were actually um had anxiety levels which are pathologically high which means which they, ones uh th these are the anxiety levels for the people that go into become a foundation year doctors without the oh, without this intern yeah training. without yeah. the yeah i can yeah. relate to that i'll, I'll comment on that in a second so <laughs> but pathological means that like it's they need intervention. In, inappropriate, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what's okay? Go on. What's your thoughts on that? Um, so, I mean, I'm not surprised at, at those findings at all. Um, the the critical thing to understand with the transition from finally your medical student to doctor is that it literally goes like this, okay? And mm. on your last day of medical school, when you're finally your medical student, you are in the exact same place, surrounded by the exact same people. Okay, looking at the same patients, blah, 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 um, except you have zero responsibility. Nothing, all right? Mm -hmm. not, if you don't do anything, it's going to be fine. Nothing's going to happen, all right? You're not required to take those bloods. You're not required to make a decision. You're not required to make a diagnosis, whatever. That's your final, your final day of medical school. And then two months later, you're in the exact same position, except you have all the responsibility, right? And so that jump is huge, okay? It's not to be underestimated. It's not to be, um, you know, downplayed or anything like that. And I feel like you certainly feel that responsibility. Now, the important thing is what support networks you have in place, okay? So take any F1 doctor and put them in the role of an F1 on their very first day, on their very first job, and they're going to be completely lost, okay? Mm. No matter how active they were in medical school, how much they studied. And, you know, you can take me as, a, as an example of someone who was further along the spectrum of a hardworking studying student who attended placement most days, like I am on that side of the spectrum, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, I won't say I was the nerdiest kid who studied the hardest or the most, because I wasn't, but I'm far on that side of the spectrum compared to the other side, okay? Yeah. And I was a fish out of the water when I started my F1 job. So imagine okay? the guy on the other side. So there's a whole spectrum of other people, okay, who are not on that side, who might who might have had a harder time than me, who might have had an easier time than me, whatever. Um, but what, the point that I'm trying to make is, even for someone who was a very high achiever in medical school, myself, okay, it was still a huge transition. The key, the important thing that helps make or break that experience is your support network. Who you're surrounded by, how much help they give you, how much they nurture you, how much whatever. Mm. So, generally speaking, if you're in a like a big tertiary center like the one that we're in, in central London. It's, uh, you know, a very large teaching hospital, etc. You'll have more seniors and more support um, than you might if you are in a district general hospital further outside of London where it's a lot smaller um, and there isn't as much staffing, for example. Um, and so to give you my experience and my example, um, you know, I was surrounded by 
several uh, doctors of all grades, SHOs, junior clinical fellows, registrars, and consultants, who have all been absolutely wonderful in terms of um, creating an open environment where I could ask questions without feeling judged. And, um, you know, were always willing to listen to me and to help me. And if I was concerned about a patient or a decision or whatever, I never thought twice about asking and saying, hey, guys, I don't know what to do here. Like, can you please help me? And that's been amazing. And I feel like without that, this could have been a very different conversation and a very different experience. And I'm sure there's a lot of my F1 colleagues who have gone through, you know, a situation where they didn't have that support, where they may have been belittled or bullied or uh, made to feel like they can't be as open uh, talking to or seeking support rather, which is which is horrible. And, uh, you know, that's mm. not a fun experience to be in. Um, but so much of your experience is made up from that, I think. And no matter how much you prepare in medical school, you have to actually do the job to find out what it's like. You know, um, I reached a point in my final year of medical school where I'd gone to placement so much. I had taken so many exams. I had taken so many histories. I had done so many bloods. And I was like, okay, like this is it. I've, I've completed the medical school experience. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else that I need to learn or responsibility that I need to have, I have to just, I need to have the responsibility. I need to have title doctor next to my name and it needs to be my responsibility that this stuff gets done. That's how that's how I'm going to learn more. That's the next step that I need to take. You've reached, you saturated that and you're like, okay, what's the next step? Give me the responsibility and yeah. that's how I'm going to learn. Exactly. By the end of medical school, I, I had saturated the experience of being a medical student. Mm-hmm. For sure. So you, if you had actually attended this interim foundation year program, mm. I guess that would have helped. Wow, I went on the longest tangent ever. Sorry, back to that question. <laughs> it, was, it was, to be honest, my question was a bit too long. I, that's, that's the one thing I have to, oh, I should have shortened that down. Tangent. No, I, um, it was very, yeah. But I think I started my, my answer by saying that I completely agree with the, what was said there. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the reason is that you have to actually do the job, okay? So those F1s who did the interim F1 yeah. thing, they started working four months mm-hmm. before the traditional F1s, right? Mm-hmm. In those four months, they will have learned the exact same thing as the F1 starting at the normal time would learn in their four months. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. doesn't actually matter where that teaching was. It's just about the time. It's just about the experience. Like okay. the first time you see a patient alone, your anxiety is going to be here. And the tenth time it's going to be here. And the hundredth time it's going to be here. So okay. it, it's not like it. Yeah. It's, it was just, it's just pushed repetition. a bit further. Exactly. It was the same thing is just pushed a bit further back. Okay. In my opinion, I think that um, you just have to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's one of those things. And, you have to uh, take take the leap, take the jump, and yeah. And it, hope personally, the best. I feel that it's all about repetition. You know, like on on our ward, the first time the crash call, the crash bell got called. You know, I was shitting myself. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, "What the hell do I do? Like, where do I go? Like, what am I supposed to do when I show up?" You know, we had run through ATE in medical school a hundred times. Yeah, but, but the first time it got cold, I did not know what to what do. Happened? I did was you, shocked. Did you go there and you were like, "Hey, hey, I did, airway?" I just, well, you know, I had my my colleagues there who were much more senior oh, than me, and they so immediately true. got to work and started doing things, and I was just there, like, you know, really, really shocked, and uh, you know. 40, 50 crash bell calls later, um, you know, I approach the situation with a lot more calmness. I Mm. feel like I still don't know exactly what to do and I certainly don't run the whole thing. Um, But I just feel a bit more confident. I feel a bit more in place. I've done Mm -hmm. some of those things before. So it's the same thing, you know, first time crash bell gets called, I'm very, very anxious. 10th time, I'm not that anxious. 50th time, I feel a lot better. Um, And so it's just about experience. Yeah, I mean, I guess no, you're right. You just have to do it. There's there there's no other formula to it. You do it, you learn, yeah. then you do it fifty times, you become better at it. Exactly. So like, yeah. Yeah. I get that. Repetition is key. Um, can you make it through foundation year without coffee? <laughs> I've a, I've a lot of colleagues who don't drink coffee. Um, who don't drink tea. Maybe they have like a Pepsi. Some of them don't have it at all. So you can. I don't know who. I don't know how. All right. I I don't know how. <laughs> I don't understand these people. <laughs> I, I have coffee throughout the whole day. Like they have those little instant coffee things in the kitchen. Yeah. Which suck. Just for the record, they <laughs> you, suck. You, you have an acquired taste for coffee. But like they're been... just, not not even. Not even. Not even. <laughs> it's just they're they're that bad. Um, but there's no there's no good alternative. 
and uh, I just down it. To be honest, like it doesn't really matter what I'm drinking. I just want something hot to do this motion with. Like you know, that, that's all I need. I need something to like fidget with, something to drink, something um, just to make me feel like I'm being fueled. Yeah, you know? it doesn't matter if you replaced it with probably like. A, uh, Great a juice. stuffed animal and I just did this motion <laughs> I would probably get the same effect <laughs> genuinely like, uh, it's just a uh, habit it's just a yeah. thing that like I believe makes me work better and more focused Plac and so, and placebo so effect yeah exactly Maybe. back to the placebo yeah. I was listening I don't drink coffee by the way I, I drink it you know like, it's not like I'm like this a, time. A, a no but like I, I'll, <clears throat> I'll drink it as a and I was listening to Huberman pod, the Huberman podcast yesterday. He he did another episode for coffee, okay. and he was just going on about all the positive things that coffee can do for you. Mm. Uh, it's like amazing for your. I'm, I'm not going to call him, but yeah, you could just go listen to the podcast. Very nice podcast. Mm. And then he talked about the fact that coffee is a positive reinforcer. Mm. So whatever you're doing at that time, it reinforces that idea and it makes you like that idea so for example if you're having coffee now with me and you're sitting and having a conversation there's so I a like you more yes <laughs> so my plan so the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like and he says the motion of holding a cup and bringing it to your mouth and that you like that motion and you feel yeah. it's exactly what you described here you were 100%. saying and i was like yes like that that's what he was talking about 100 percent. yeah i mean the, like it's going to get really nerdy, but the the power of social cues and environmental cues to, you know, get yourself in a certain mindset or a certain zone, whether it's a study zone, a fun zone, a relax zone, whatever, is so underestimated. I mean, you can take anything. It honestly does not matter what it is. Um, and you can associate it with some particular activity that you do. You know, some common things you might have heard are chewing gum while taking an exam. Mm. If you only chew gum when you take an exam, the next time you chew gum, you're going to be in that mindset and in that zone of chewing gum of excuse me <laughs> of writing an exam yeah um and you can do this with anything absolutely anything i mean you can change the the lights of the colors in your room you can change the position of different objects on your desk for when you're studying for when you're relaxing for when you're doing this um you can make it up as you go along okay <laughs> you just have to you just have to believe that it, that it's working and you have to commit to the thing that you're doing and and it will work it will have it will make a difference um mm. genuinely atomic habits is the book where i was I'm quoting all these things from i was about to um, say yeah, that because i've read that book as well book, and i was like yeah. yeah so when i read atomic habits i was like wow i've been doing these things my whole life i just didn't have a name for them yeah um you feel that somebody yeah, it felt really good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no you're right and one of the things that he says in atomic habits is the environment plays such a role in everything like, and i got this and i i I wrote this down and one of the things that's coming up uh, about like hospitals like mm. if a patient uh, that the studies on this there's green around him like there's some words here that have it um it you get better outcomes better mm. patient care outcomes just because there's a tree on the wall and they just feel like they're outside they're not in a like <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. absolutely 100 percent true yeah <sighs> do you want to continue yeah hit me man yeah, yeah. okay so um Are we you did bored yet? <laughs> <laughs> i'm loving it as well so yeah it's going good <laughs> so workplace bullying uh -huh. so does it happen mm. and how easy is it to raise concerns there was mm. a study published by chan lo tao in the sage journal 2019 mm. surveyed 450 foundation year doctors in the uk mm. and ireland 39 mm. percent reported that they had been bullied. Mm. 26 by more senior doctors, 10% by nurses, two by managers, one by patient, three by peers, and eight more by one more person. So going back to the question, yeah, does it happen? Are you surprised by these results? And how is it <clears throat> to raise concerns? Um, A lot to take in there, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, I think workplace, workplace bullying is definitely a thing that does happen. Um, I can very easily see and imagine a million scenarios where it could happen. Um, I think it's important that I say that I haven't personally experienced it um, in this first rotation that I've done. And so, you know, I won't be talking from personal experience for a lot of this. Um, but again, this comes back to something I said before that when I feel that I'm able to ask questions freely to my seniors and I'm able to reach out to them for support and I'm able to say to them, I'm sorry, I don't know. Can you help me? 
if that did not exist, okay, like life would be very, very difficult, okay? Mm -hmm. And I can very easily see scenarios because, you know, I've worked with difficult people. I've had difficult conversations on the phone with other colleagues and I'll talk about those in a second. But if I found myself in a scenario where I knew that if I asked someone a question, I would be ridiculed or I would be made to feel stupid or inferior or mm -hmm. whatever, that would make um, raising those concerns very, very difficult. And obviously, the right thing to do is to raise those concerns because at the end of the day, you're dealing with patients, you're dealing with, you know, uh, things that are really important. Um, but if it's hard to raise those concerns, you know, it'll take a toll on you, on your mental health, on, on whatever. Um, and although I haven't personally faced or experienced any workplace bullying, <laughs> I've just had some absurd conversations with colleagues. <coughs> Most of the time over the phone, um, I tend to be a... Pr so, you know, in your day-to-day -day as a doctor, you spend a lot of time on the phone, like yeah. a lot, a lot of time. And it's almost always calling other specialties and asking for their advice. So a neurologist, a rheumatologist, a cardiologist, a gastroenterologist and saying, hey, I have this patient, blah, 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 blah. What do you think? Or what's your advice on this? Or can you look at this scan? Or whatever. So you spend a lot of time talking to people on the phone. Um, and I've just had some absurd encounters. I mean, I was once, I picked up the phone, I said, you know, hi, good afternoon, my name is Nasser. The guy's like, uh, uh, cardiology registrar, like, what's up? And I was like, oh, like, how are you doing today? Very brief, like, quick question before I got into my main question about the patient. And they're like, uh, I said something along the lines of, do you want me to tell you how I really feel or do you want me to tell you something just to make you feel better? And I was like, that's like a punch in the stomach. All right. It's like, <laughs> cool, cool. No problem, man. We can just get right into the yeah. story, you know? Um, and just, you know, interactions along those lines where when I close the call, I think to myself, like, God, like, how miserable do you have to be to talk to someone on the phone like that? Like, you know, mm. I start every call with good morning. I end it with thank you so much for your time. You know, I try to have a bit of fun engagement when I'm talking to someone on the phone. Um, just out of politeness, nothing else really. Um, and yeah, it just, it rubs me the wrong way when people are so just like rude or miserable or short, uh, you know, we're all working towards the same goal. I'm not calling you for fun to waste your time. <laughs> I'm calling you because I'm concerned and I have a question and yeah. you're a specialist in this field, right? So, um, and you know, I think even if, you know, as F1s, um, you are, <laughs> you have a higher percentage chance of calling someone and wasting their time with mm. a question that might not be valid or that you could have asked someone else or that you weren't prepared for. It happens. But, um, you know, I think as a senior, you should take that opportunity to explain what might have gone wrong, like what you can do next time. Like shouting at an F1 for doing that is just stupid. Um, but it happens. It happens. Um, so anyways, I went on a very long tangent. We were talking about workplace bullying. Um, so yeah, it does happen. I haven't personally experienced it myself. Um, but not, I think this is part of it. It might not be bullying, bullying, but... Yeah, like, look... It's a lack of compassion. So look, different people would take it a different way, okay? Mm. I can... You I, I know people <laughs> who would, you know, have heard that response and their entire day would be ruined. Mm. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily blame them for that. You know, people take these things in different ways and are more sensitive or to different things. Um, personally, I don't know this person. I, I don't care enough to get angry or upset mm. about it. Um, I was just a bit stunned when it happened and I laughed about it with my colleagues. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, depending on the person on the receiving end of the phone, you can take it in a very different way. I agree. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So moving on, do you know, what, do you know what crown indemnity is? Crown indemnity. You know what that means? This is not me testing you. I didn't know either. It's okay. So don't feel embarrassed. 92% <laughs> of foundation year doctors don't know what it is. It okay. basically it's from the same study. Uh, it means that your employing NHS trust will be liable for any claim made by the patient treated by you, mm. which is pretty interesting. Mm. And it's just random fact I just had. <laughs> yeah, so my, uh, my consultant is a very, very lovely gentleman. Um, and he has a lot of experience in going to court for a million different things regarding the patients Ooh. that he's looked after and, you know, complaints that have been made by the families and whatever. Because his name is, you know, the consultant's name is always attached to each patient. So yeah. if anyone in the chain of command makes a mistake, like the consultant always has to answer for it. Anyways, mm. um, so, you know, he tells us that 
you know, the vast majority of the time, the NHS always settles with whoever is making the complaint. So they give um, them the money, basically. Yeah, um, because apparently it's a lot cheaper than dragging out the the situation uh, for a long time. Uh, but yes, I did know that. I just didn't know that was the name. Doesn't send a good vibe to people, though. It means I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's I'll really, sue the NHS and they'll give them money just so. It's the practicalities of, of the situation. I don't think. Yeah. It, I don't. Th it should not reflect. I think negatively or positively against the mm. NHS. It's just uh, this, this is the reality of the situation. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we've done all that. Should we do it to last fifteen minutes? Do some more personal questions. <laughs> so <Yeah>. she. <laughs> what advice? What advice yeah. have your parents given you that you hold dear to your heart? Wow, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, if somebody asked me that question, I'd be like, "Oh no, wow, so much." <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. <sighs> Probably what what sticks uh, sticks out the most in my mind because of how many times I've heard it is my dad always saying to me something along the lines of set get your priorities straight or set your priorities correctly and he would always say this when he thought I was not studying enough and, and going out and having fun and blah blah <laughs> blah you know like dads always do and the truth is I was always studying um, so <laughs> there was no need for it um, but no the, the underlying message is just not you know, whatever your priorities are, whether that's getting A-star grades throughout university or getting grades that you are happy with, that you feel comfortable with, whether that's like A's, B's, C's, whatever, um, and spending your time on your family, on your friends, on, on partying in social life, if that's what's really important to you, fair enough. Um, you know, everyone will have their own, <coughs> excuse me, their own set of priorities. And I think you just need to figure out what that is and make sure that you get it done within the constraints of the real world, which is, if I want to be a doctor, I need to get a certain amount of grades, I need to have a certain amount of work experience. And so if grades and work experience are not your priority, but your priority is to be a doctor, that doesn't necessarily align. Um, so within the constraints of the real world, figure out what you actually need to do, and sort of the, the minimum that you need to achieve in order to get to where you want to be, um, and then prioritize your life accordingly, and uh, do the things that you actually find fun that you enjoy that will keep you going I think that's good advice set your house set your house straight in order yeah absolutely exactly focus on the important things mm. what advice would you give to any medical students hmm I feel like it's so hard looking back um, to give advice because I, I feel mentally so far away from it and the the truth is I generally found medical school a relatively, you know, simple and continuous process. There were obviously times that were a lot more challenging, a lot more difficult, like exam periods, final year was particularly uh, busy. But generally speaking, um, you know, I tackled most parts of medical school in the same way, which was, what do I need to do? How am I going to do it? How much time is this going to take? And like, you know, here's my schedule. Let me put yeah. this time block here. Let me put this time block there. And I found that trying to break down my obstacles and my tasks and my to-do lists and whatever into smaller and smaller pieces until it was easy to um, sort of think about and conceptualize made my time throughout medical school very simple because everything was the same. It didn't matter if it was an essay or a tutorial worksheet or my final exam or the SJT. They could all be broken down into smaller and smaller and smaller steps and each one of those small steps could be completed in a certain amount of time and i could just put that time into one of my week days you know um so i think medical school can feel very overwhelming especially if you think about the big picture because there is a lot to do um but every single one of those things can be broken down and i think if you sit there with a pen and paper and you break it down your life will become so much easier um, because you know you can complete every individual part of that bigger, you know, task, whatever it is. Um, so break things down into smaller pieces, I guess, is, is my is my advice. I think that would also help people with stress because when, <clears throat> like when you have a lot of stuff to do, it's like it just seems impossible. Like, how am I ever going to do this? Yeah. And then you, like you said, you break it down into simple steps, and then you're like, I I, I can actually do this now. 
And then the next thing, oh, I'm done with this. Move on to the next 100%. thing. Step by step, like do this, number one, number two, number three, and you'll get yeah, there. Definitely. Like, And just offload, like take take things out of your head and out of your mind, put them on a piece of paper. That helps so Write much. them into Notion. Fucking talk to your friend about <laughs> it, whatever. Like, <laughs> just get it. So many people, they sit there with a hundred things going on that's stressing them out, and they just keep them all in their head, you know? That's not gonna help. Like just take it out of your head, Put it on a piece of paper, put it on something you can actually see, and then that relieves mental space from you. And, and then you know what you need to do, and you can break each one of those tasks down into smaller tasks. And it, for me, it becomes so much simpler. Um, but just sitting there being stressed is not going to help, you know? Just write things down, talk to someone. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel the same, the same thing. Like whenever I'm like, I catch myself being stressed about things. I'm like, mm. oh no, I have to do this, I have to do this. I'm like, okay, relax, sit down. Take a piece of paper or I open my notes on my iPhone. I'm like, yeah, I've, got, I've got a, a note that's always there. It's called tasks. And Stress. I, and <laughs> <laughs> it's like, open this in case of... <laughs> and I open it up and I'm like, I've got quick, ta quick tasks and like long-term tasks. And I just put yeah. everything there. And once I've done that, I stop ruminating <clears throat> about it. And I stop like... Exactly. I like there's this nice analogy. I don't remember where I heard this about. This is like... A cow, uh, cows when they eat food, they have they like they do it like seven times. <laughs> they digest it seven times. That's how the human brain works sometimes. Like before you mm. go to sleep, you just ruminate and ruminate. Like you, you like sure. chew on the same information constantly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? I think I think that kind of brings us to the end of it. Um, oh, okay. One last one, and then. One more cheeky. cheeky one, one, one more. <laughs> what does yeah. what does self compassion mean to you? Self-compassion. Mm. <clears throat> You've okay. realized I like okay. the word compassion. All right. <laughs> um, I, think, I think I've only really understood self-care um, mm -hmm. in recent times. Since actually from when I started doing therapy in the end of my fourth year of medical school. I think before then, I didn't realize that uh, sometimes I had to just sit there and think about what was going on in my life in order to truly digest it and understand it and have a think about what can I be doing better? What can what can help me in this situation? Before that, I was just go, 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 go. And I didn't think about any of this stuff. I didn't have any self-compassion. It was, it doesn't matter if you want to go to the gym or not. In your schedule, it says go to the gym. So you're going to the gym. You know, It doesn't matter if you want to play video games right now. Your exam is on Wednesday and you still have three chapters to do. So you're going to do one chapter today. There was no... There was no, uh, you know, weighing up. There was no balancing involved. It was very simple. I just had flow charts that I followed, and decision. My decision making was extremely, you know, binary. It was very logical, um, and I didn't understand uh, what it meant to sit there and reflect on how I felt about all those things. Mm. Um, and so, self compassion for me now uh, means taking the time to actually check in with myself and say, like Nasser, how do you feel this evening, right? I know you said you were going to go to the gym, but actually, do you think maybe sitting down to watch a movie would be better for you in two hours from now? Um, and then, you know, taking the time to think about that decision and weigh up the pros and cons and be like, you know what? Fuck it, yeah, I'm going to sit down and watch a movie today. <laughs> yeah. Which is something I, I would have never dreamed of, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, having that ability to check in with myself and, um, and ask myself, how are you doing? That's what I feel like self-compassion is for me. Yeah. Um, and I try to do that as much as I can now. I'm certainly a lot better at it uh, than I used to be, but there's a, a long way to go as well. Um, but I'm working on it, one step at a time. I feel that too. I think one thing that's helped me do that, because I don't know, I'm <laughs> sure it's, you kind of relate to this as well and you Simone, like your day is just filled with stuff. Like it's one thing after the other, after the other, and it just doesn't allow you to just like you said, take take a step back and say, how do I actually feel about what I'm doing? Mm. How do I actually feel about my program today? About what I'm about to do? You don't ask yourself that. You just you just do it. Like you're just a machine. You just do, do this, yeah. do this, do this. It's very true. And then I was like, recently I've started doing this, and like before I go to bed, I just have some time where I just don't do anything. Like I, I kind of dim the lights and I just sit on my bed and I just think about how I'm feeling. Yeah. And it's, it's weird. Which is and really I'm like, powerful to be And honest. you know, sometimes uh, at the beginning I was like, I just felt weird. What yeah. am I doing just, you know, like just sitting by myself and just thinking? Like, because you don't usually do it. You never actually think about this stuff. It's very true. Yeah. Um, some, some people are really good at this and not, not to overgeneralize, but I feel like 
generally speaking, at least from the experiences I've had in my life, um, women tend to be better at this. And I think, mm. you know, my girlfriend is an excellent example. And another great example is uh, Kenji, who was a colleague of mine who uh, went to medical school with me. He also has a YouTube channel. Um, and their ability to think about how they feel and reflect on situations is just unbelievable. I mean, I, <laughs> I could never dream of reaching that level of, of depth and reflection in my own life. Um, and so I, I learn a lot from them and I, and I try to, to take into account the types of things that, that they do and think mm. about. I think they're just a lot more in touch with uh, their feelings and their sense of being. For, for me, I'm just like, just do the to-do list, like go to work, come back, go have fun, like <laughs> relax. Um, but I'm trying to change. I'm trying to become better with that for sure. Maybe that's why we cry more. Yeah, maybe. You know, <laughs> maybe we're improving. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. That's the sign that you're in touch with, with how yeah. you feel. One step at a time. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah. I think that brings us to the end of it. And awesome, man. Thank you. It's been amazing. You're Thank you for doing this. I got a good gift for you. Wait, let me you got a get gift it. for me? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you did not have to was, get me a gift. Uh, don't worry. It was just, I was in my house this uh, morning and I was like, mm, I just saw this. I was like, yeah, I think he's going to appreciate it. And then I got a gift for Simone as well. He actually is here. So. Oh, I got gifts for everyone. Let's have yeah. a, it's Oprah. It's, it's Christmas. It's before it. <laughs> what have you bought? So this, this is not any, this, this, this is, is not, not sponsored. This, this is not sponsored. <laughs> so I'm going to hide it. This is, Greek Cypriot coffee. Ah, amazing. So I know you like coffee. It'll give me a good feeling of home. Thank you so yeah. much. You, I'm you. sure you know how to. Yeah, to make a Turkish coffee, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Where Greek coffee is, you would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, does it smell like home? No, it doesn't have a thing. You can open it and just be like. But yeah. then. No, no. <laughs> We're saving this. It's, it's going in the pot. Uh, and then I got, this is one of my favorite teas. Uh, Wow, because you're, this is very nice. This is uh, this is mixed herbal tea. It's from it's from this monastery in Cyprus uh, called Timiu Prodrom mm, Mesa uh, Yeah, it's 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 lovely tea. Thank you, it's thank you for being here. Cold. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Simone. So yeah, that's about it. Thank right. you. Awesome. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Obviously, not yet, not yet. You can't yeah. forget that. <laughs> yeah. Also, don't forget. I don't usually say that at the end. I'm like, consider subscribing. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Maybe. Whatever you want to subscribe. <laughs> I'll do it for yeah. you. Don't worry. Okay, go for it. Should we do that peace thing that you do? Yeah, What's that thing? Can, I mean, there's three cameras. I don't know. So what let's do like. Um, yeah. Peace. Yeah. Peace. So, thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Have fun. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Peace. <laughs>